All right, hello everyone. This is the video that corresponds to the handout I gave in class entitled The Straight Poop, Physics 30. The purpose of these videos and the purpose of this handout is not to provide you with a bunch of uh, physics problems that you can practice. You've already been given lots of that material. You have all kinds of released items from the government. I've given you a massive document with, I think, around 300 multiple choice and numerical response questions broken down by topic. The purpose of this video is to go through all of the content in the course to trigger your memory in terms of some things that are going to be very helpful for you when you're writing the diploma exam and solving physics problems. So again, this is Physics 30, the straight poop. This first video, I think I'm going to go through Unit 1 and Unit 2. Unit 1 deals with momentum and impulse. We started off the course by learning that momentum is defined as the product of mass and velocity. It's a very simple formula. It's one that I don't think anybody has any difficulty using, except that you need to remember since velocity is a vector, that means that momentum is a vector. And quite often in physics, particularly physics 20, you might have gotten used to not including direction when you did calculations, or not including direction when you did an analysis. And in physics 20, a lot of the time, what ends up happening is you still get the right answer. Your answer is just opposite to what it should be. You can't get away with that in physics 30. If direction is not included, you're very, very likely to get an incorrect result. You're expected to know, and this is almost always asked in some form or another on the diploma exam, you're expected to know the difference between scalars and vectors and be able to provide examples of scalars and vectors. Examples of scalars, which are things that have a magnitude, a value, but do not have a direction. Examples of scalars include mass, charge, time, energy. I don't have it on here but potential difference as well is a scalar. For some reason, students want to sometimes elevate the concept of energy or potential difference or voltage to a level of calling it a vector. Energy does not have a direction. If you have a Snickers bar with a particular number of calories of energy or a particular number of joules of energy in the candy bar, it makes no sense that it's, you know, 320 calories east. Energy is just an amount of energy. It has no direction. And since potential difference is really defined in terms of energy, and we will get to that later, potential difference would be a scalar as well. Vectors that we study in physics 20 and 30, momentum, impulse, velocity, force, acceleration, the fields that we study have all been vector fields. Electric fields, magnetic fields, and gravitational fields are all vector fields, but there are such things as scalar fields. And occasionally on a diploma exam, they describe a field to you and ask you about whether it's a scalar field or a vector field. An example would be a voltage field. There is such a thing as a voltage field, a region of space where when you go to different locations in that region in space, there's a different voltage. So we call that a voltage field. But since voltage, also known as potential difference, is simply energy divided by charge, and energy and charge are both scalars, voltage is a scalar. So a voltage field would be a scalar field. I'm just mentioning that because I don't want you to believe that all fields have direction. Not all fields have direction. Impulse is very, very closely tied to momentum, but impulse is not momentum. What impulse is is the change in an object's momentum. So momentum describes the state of an object at a particular point in time. Its mass times its velocity at that instant. What impulse does is gives us a description of the behavior of the object or the properties of the object from one point in time to another. It's the final momentum minus the initial momentum. 
There are a number of ways that you can find impulse. You can take the average net force being applied to the object and multiply by the time over which that force is applied. Or you can take the mass times the change in the velocity. The change in the velocity, of course, is Vf minus Vi. This will be the second or third time out of maybe a dozen times in this review of momentum and impulse where I remind you once again, direction is important. So when you calculate impulse using either of these formulas, you need to enter positives if the quantities are in a positive direction and negative if they are in a negative direction. Putting F delta T and M delta V together gives you this formula from your formula sheet. This is a way that, I guess it, what it does is it marries some kinematics ideas to some dynamics ideas. And it allows you to do calculations fairly quickly when it comes to objects experiencing accelerated motion. Once again, direction is important. Once again, that force is the net force, and it's the average force. There's a third way for you to calculate impulse, and that's if you have a graph that's a force as a function of time graph. Since force multiplied by time gives you impulse, the area between the graph and the time axis will give you the impulse. So in this particular case, what you would have to do is break this shape up into a number of rectangles and triangles and use the basic geometry formulas for area of a rectangle and area of a triangle in order to find the total area. Occasionally, even though I think it's a physics 20 idea, I have seen on the diploma exam them ask you about the area associated with a force displacement graph. And in physics 20, you learn that force multiplied by displacement is work or change in energy. So that means that the area associated with this graph would be work. So force time graphs give you an area of impulse. Force displacement graphs give you an area of work or change in energy. I call this the impulse holy trinity because since there's three ways for you to calculate impulse, you can use F net delta T, you can use M delta velocity, or you can use the area of a force time graph, you can always set any two of those three equal to each other. So maybe you have a problem on your exam coming up where you have a graph and you're asked to determine the final velocity of the object. Well, what you can do is find the area associated with that force time graph and then take that impulse that you've just found and set it equal to m delta v and proceed from there. You can always set the area equal to f delta t. And of course, you can always set f delta t equal to m delta v. That's on your formula sheet. Remember, the force for the third time is the net force and it's an average force. And for at least the third time, whenever you're dealing with vectors, don't forget to include directions. You are expected to know, and those of you that have taken calculus understand this a little bit clearer than I think those who haven't, that area above a horizontal axis counts as a positive quantity and area below counts as a negative quantity. So for example, if you were given this graph, it shows a force changing uniformly from six newtons in one direction to nine units in an opposite direction over a time interval of 18 seconds. If you were asked, what is the total impulse? Well, you would say, well, impulse is the area associated with this graph. So you would look at this triangle above the x-axis, or the time axis, I should say. And it's a triangle, so you would take one half the base times the height. 1 half times 8 times 6 is going to give you 24. And I've labeled it as positive 24 newton seconds because it's above the x-axis. When you want to find the impulse experienced during the last 10 seconds from 8 seconds to 18 seconds, again, it's a triangle. You can take 1 half the base. The base of this triangle is 10. The height is 9. 
1 half times 10 times 9 gives 45, but since it's below the time axis, it's negative 45. That would mean the total impulse is negative 45 newton seconds plus 24 newton seconds, which gives you negative 21 newton seconds, or 21 newton seconds of impulse in a negative direction. Safety devices are very often asked about on the diploma exam. The idea behind a safety device is that if you're traveling at a particular speed, and we can use riding on the passenger seat of a car as an example, and the car is traveling at 50 kilometers per hour, it doesn't matter how the car stops. If you take your mass times your speed that you have before you stop, that will be the impulse you experience. And you're going to experience that impulse whether you're stopped very abruptly or whether you're stopped over a long period of time. The greater the stopping time, the smaller the force because your impulse, which has to be your change in momentum, is going to be the same no matter how you stop. So since impulse is force times change in time, if you have a very, very long time, you require less force. And this is kind of a bit of common sense. On the other hand, if you're stopped very quickly, then that requires a larger force. Just to look at that from the other side, that means that when you apply a greater force, you get a, slow, a less stopping time. You get a smaller stopping time. And that requires a bit of thought. If the stopping time is very small, that means you stop quickly. However, if there's a smaller force applied, it's going to take the object longer to stop, so the time to stop is greater. Safety devices don't decrease impulse. Almost always, if you're given a multiple choice question on an exam that asks about how a safety device works, almost always there's a choice that says, oh, well, it decreases the impulse experienced by the person. And that sounds like a very reasonable, very tempting choice to pick for a correct answer. Unfortunately, it's wrong. What a safety device does is it decreases the force and the acceleration experienced by the person by increasing the time it takes for the person to stop. So an airbag, uh, relative to a seat belt, an airbag has more give to it. So when you're stopped by an airbag, the airbag slows you down over a larger time, reducing the stopping force and preventing serious injuries. We're going to get into collisions now, and there's two ideas you need to wrap your head around in terms of collisions. The first one is the type of system in which a collision can happen. So when a collision between two objects occurs, it can occur in what we call an isolated system or what we call a non-isolated system. What an isolated system is, by definition, is a system where when those two objects collide, and in Physics 30, we always limit ourselves to two objects colliding. When those two objects collide, object A applies a force to object B that's exactly equal but opposite to the force that B applies to A. So if I hit a baseball with a bat, and when I make contact with the ball, the bat applies a force of a thousand newtons north to the ball. That means the ball must apply a force of a thousand newtons south to the bat. And if you add those two forces together, this is what the word total means. It means add. If I add those two forces together, I will get zero. A non-isolated system is one where that is not true. And you might ask yourself how that's possible. Basically, it's possible when there's some other force that's interfering with the interaction. Maybe it's a significant force of friction that's acting on one of the objects while it's being hit by the second object. 
But the bottom line, in an isolated system, the forces are equal but opposite. And that means what we often see on an exam is there are no outside forces present. In a non-isolated system, the only way the net force can not be zero is if there's some other force acting that you're not taking into account. The bottom line, and this is where the application of it becomes important, is that you are allowed to apply conservation of momentum if it's an isolated system, but you are not allowed to apply conservation of momentum if it's a non-isolated system. So when you're reading a problem on an exam, on a diploma exam, you might often see during the collision between the two objects, there are no outside forces present. Or during the collision between the two objects, there are no significant forces of friction present. And what that's doing is giving you permission to use conservation of momentum because it's telling you it's an isolated system. The second idea that you need to wrap your head around in terms of collisions is not where they occur, but the type of collision that it is. And a collision between objects, and again, I will limit myself to two objects, a collision between two objects can either be elastic or inelastic. And this has to do with energy during the collision. If the kinetic energy in the entire system is conserved, then it's elastic. Now, you know, be careful here. If you have two objects that collide and it's an elastic collision, which means kinetic energy is conserved, that doesn't mean that one of the objects can't lose kinetic energy. It just means that however much kinetic energy that one object loses, the other has to gain the same amount. So if you're trying to determine if a collision is elastic, you're going to find the kinetic energy of every single object before the collision and add those kinetic energies together. Kinetic energy, of course, is one-half mv squared. And then you're going to do the same thing for all of the objects afterwards. And when you add up the kinetic energies afterwards, if you get the same number of joules that you had to begin with, it is an elastic collision. Clearly, then, an inelastic or non-elastic collision is one in which kinetic energy is not conserved. To be perfectly honest with you, the only purely elastic collisions that we ever encounter in Physics 30 would be at the molecular or atomic or subatomic level. To jump ahead in the course, if you look at something like the photoelectric effect, which is a collision between a photon and an electron, that is purely elastic. Or the Compton effect, which also happens to be a collision between a photon and an electron. Or any kind of radioactive decay, for example, alpha decay. Alpha decay is purely elastic. The energy that you have before the decay and the energy that you have after the decay are equal. Now, you want to be careful here because you'll notice I didn't say kinetic energy. I said energy because when you get down to radioactive decay, there are other types of energy present, not just kinetic energy. There's what we call mass energy. But that's not really that relevant to what we're talking about here. Um, if it is an inelastic collision, then the energy that was kinetic that is missing afterwards is always lost to heat and sound. This is further reason why you can't have a purely elastic collision between objects at the macroscopic level. Because when objects collide, there's going to be some form of heat, and there will always be some sound produced. There might also be light produced. Uh, collisions at the macroscopic level between bowling balls and curling stones and pool balls are pretty darn close to being elastic. I'd have to look up some numbers, but I wouldn't be surprised if it's anywhere from 95 to 99% of the kinetic energy that's conserved. But even though some is lost, uh, that doesn't make it elastic. Even if it's just a little bit that's lost, it's still classified as inelastic.
When you apply conservation of momentum during a collision, and the collision occurs in what's called a linear system, which means that the objects are traveling left and right, or only in one dimension, generally speaking. You have to remember that when we say total momentum before equals total momentum after, since momentum is a vector, you need to have some way to include direction in your work, in your analysis. And the way we do it, and we can only do this with linear, is for every velocity that's in a negative direction, you assign that velocity a negative value. So if you have a collision between two rubber balls, and they each have momentum before, and they each have momentum after, then your basic equation that you're going to set up would be mv of the one rubber ball before plus mv of the second rubber ball before equals mv of the first rubber ball after plus mv of the second rubber ball after. And if any of those velocities or any of those motions were to the left, then when you put in the velocity, you would have to put a negative for v. So if you're told that rubber ball number one initially was traveling at three centimeters per second left, you would put negative three in for the velocity. And again, these types of collisions occur only in one dimension. So every motion is either left or right, or it's north or south, etc. Two-dimensional collisions, I'll get back to the word explosion in just a minute, but when you have a collision, what happens when objects hit each other is they push off of each other. And if you think of an explosion, like firing a bullet from a rifle, the bullet and the rifle push off of each other. So in terms of forces, there's really no difference between what happens when two objects are approaching each other, hit each other, and bounce off of each other, as opposed to when two objects are together and push off of each other. There's a force pushing the objects away from each other. When you're dealing with two-dimensional collisions in an isolated system, and you want to apply the principle of the law of conservation of momentum, it becomes really, really shady. It becomes difficult here. Because there's no easy way to write out a formula and include the directions if the directions can include things like 38 degrees south of east and north and 22 degrees west of south. If you had those three different directions in a problem, you can't put them into one formula. So what I have highlighted here is that the momentum before equals the momentum after from a vector diagram. When you're solving these problems, there are generally speaking two approaches. One is a geometric approach, a mathematical visual approach with a diagram. If the momentum before the collision must equal the momentum after, and the momentum before is found by adding vectors together, and the momentum after is found by adding vectors together, then that means that when you draw all of the vectors that occur before, tip to tail, to get a total before, that total before has to match up with all of the tip to tail momentum vectors after. So you read the problem and you start drawing all of the vectors tip to tail before, you draw all of them tip to tail after, and you match them up into one colossal vector diagram describing everything that's going on. And of course, a lot of those single vectors that are parts of the vector diagram have values of their magnitudes of momentum that you can find by going m times v. You can calculate a lot of those. Then what it becomes is using geometry or trigonometry to find the missing vector, which will lead you to the solution of the problem. The second method is, for most students, easier. I mean, if you can handle method one, method one can be very, very quick in many problems. Because in method one, you might discover that you draw a vector diagram, and then all you have to do is apply the cosine law to find your answer. 
or maybe the sign law to find your answer or some other easy trigonometric approach. But the difficult part with method one is coming up with the big diagram. So method two doesn't require a big colossal diagram showing everything. It simply requires that you find all of the X and Y components of everything before and after, and you use the idea that the X components before must add up to give the X components after. And you do the same thing with the Y. All of the Y components of the momentum before must equal all of the Y components after. You're going to have to go back and practice some of these two-dimensional problems, but when you go back and you look at how we've done some of these with components, you'll realize that what you're really doing with components is you're taking two dimensions and you're breaking it apart into two linear equations. One will be a linear equation with x's in it. One will be a linear equation with y's in it. And that is the end of unit one. So I'm going to get started on unit two here, which we call forces and fields. I'm calling it up here electric and magnetic forces and fields. So we're dealing with electric forces, electric fields, magnetic forces, and magnetic fields. Before we begin, remember that a force is something that is applied to an object. It's what creates an acceleration if it's a net force. A field is more of an abstract idea which explains where the forces come from. To begin with, To begin with, we're going to look at the laws of electrostatics. Of course, there are two types of charge, positive and negative. Charge is always conserved during any interaction. And of course, similar charges repel and opposite charges attract. There's more to this. I think it's expected that you know that when you take objects out here in the macroscopic world and you start having them interact with each other, most of the time, the charge that transfers is electrons. So it's the negative charge that tends to move around. The positive charge within objects in the macroscopic world is generally speaking in the nuclei of all of the atoms. So when we talk about charging objects or grounding objects or electrical circuits, it's the electrons that are doing all of the action. They're the things moving around. You're expected to know the difference between a conductor and an insulator. Essentially, a conductor will allow electrons to flow through it, whereas an insulator will not electro allow electrons to flow through it. A classic kind of question here where you would be asked in a way to apply this idea would be a multiple choice question where you're told that a child takes a balloon and they rub the balloon on their head and they stick the balloon to the ceiling. And you could be asked a number of things here that relate to the fact that the balloon is an insulator. You could be asked, for example, what the distribution of the negative charge put on the balloon is after the rubbing. And since the balloon is an insulator, when that balloon is rubbed on the child's hair and electrons are transferred to the balloon, those electrons will tend to pile up on the part of the balloon where the contact and the friction was happening. Whereas if the balloon were a conductor, those electrons that are all piled in that one area would end up pushing away from each other and being able to distribute around the surface of the object. By the way, it would be not difficult, but you would have to do something else if you wanted to charge a conductor by friction. You would have to make sure that you're holding the conductor so that it's not grounded. In other words, maybe you're holding a rubber glove or something. Speaking of charging objects, there are three methods of charging. We can charge by friction. What you do is you take two neutral objects. They don't have to be neutral, but they almost always are. And they do have to be different material. And the reason why is that different materials have different attraction 
to electrons. Electrons are attracted to one object or one type of material more than they are attracted to other types of material. When you rub these objects together, the electrons are loosened from the surface atoms in the materials. Here, we've got a piece of animal fur being rubbed with ebonite plastic or black plastic. The electrons transfer from one to the other. In this case, they transfer from the fur to the ebonite. And that means when you separate them, the fur is missing electrons, so it's positive. The ebonite has got extra electrons, so it's negative. Since charge is conserved, however many electrons left the fur, which is the number of electrons on the plastic, is representative of the number of electrons missing from the fur. The number of electrons missing on the fur is exactly equal to the number of extra electrons added to the plastic, which is why we say that the objects are charged equally but oppositely. When you charge objects by conduction, the word conduction means to add things together by contact. A charged object is typically touched to a neutral object. At the end of this, I will explain to you that it doesn't have to be a neutral object. The diagram you're looking at here is laughably childlike. The object on the left is negative, and it's showing four kind of negative pieces. You have to understand that if an object is truly negative, that there are countless extra electrons, not just four. We touch the two objects together, and as long as the two objects are the same material, shape, size, conductivity, all of that, what's going to happen is all of those extra electrons will distribute evenly throughout the surfaces of both of the objects. So what happens here is you end up with half of the extra electrons on one and half on the other, which means when we separate the objects, each has half of the total charge, and the objects are charged similarly. Even if one of the objects was not neutral, and even if there are positive charges involved, when you have charged objects making contact and then separating, after the separation, each of the two objects will have half of the total charge. So for example, if one of the objects had positive 10 microcoulombs of charge, and the other had negative 2 microcoulombs of charge. Positive 10 plus negative 2 is 8. 8 divided by 2 is 4. So after they are separated, each of them would have positive 4 microcoulombs of charge. Charging by induction. The word induction in this context means to cause something to happen without making contact. Another word we could use is inducing. What you do is you take a charged object and you bring it close to a neutral object. Now in this case, the charged object is that negatively charged rod. And you can see that when that negatively charged rod comes close to the metal sphere, the negative electrons in the sphere, it's going to be a metal object if you're going to want to make this work. The electrons are pushed away to the far side, furthest away from the negative rod. Because electrons are negative, they're repelled from the negative rod. But since that sphere is grounded, some of those electrons will actually be pushed into the ground. If the rod were positive, then the electrons would come out of the ground and move to the side of the sphere closest to the positively charged object. What you do now is you remove the ground, and then you remove the charging object. You have to remove the ground first. If you go from this state that you're looking at here, and you simply remove that charging object, you get it out of the picture, then all that will happen is any electrons that have left will come back in. 
And that's why sometimes this state here, if we were missing a few electrons but it's still grounded, sometimes this state is called charging temporarily by induction. But to make it permanent, you cut the ground, which basically slams the door on the electrons that have left, then you remove the grounding object. The nature of the charge of the object that was neutral to begin with is always going to be opposite to the charge or the nature of the charge on the charging object. Quite often on a diploma exam, you're given this situation. We looked at this in class, at least I would have with my class, where we have a pith ball on a thread and it's attracted to something. Maybe this sphere over here is the dome of a Van de Graaff generator. It doesn't really matter. And you're given some information on an exam and asked to determine, you're given the angle usually, and we measure the angle in class, you're usually asked to determine the magnitude of the electric force. And what happens here with most students is at this point in time they say, oh, well, I'm going to use Coulomb's law. But they end up chasing their tail on this because there's never enough information to use Coulomb's law. You're going to be using a physics 20 analysis of forces. You're going to have to draw a free body diagram to analyze this situation. By the way, you are always given the mass of this charged object. So what is a free body diagram? A free body diagram shows all of the forces that are acting on any object that's being influenced. So what other forces are acting on the object that's being influenced here? Well, the pith ball is experiencing a force of gravity. And there's a third force, because if these were the only two forces, the pith ball would go flying off kind of down and to the right. There's a third force. You can call it an equilibrium force, if you like. But it's the force that the string exerts on the pith ball. And that's the free body diagram. Now, since the pith ball is not experiencing an acceleration, in fact, it's not even moving, the three forces have to give a net force of zero. This is what you call physics principle zero on your formula sheet. Zero acceleration means zero net force. What that means is when you draw these three forces tip to tail, you have to get zero. So with a vector diagram, when I draw the force that the string exerts on the pith ball, tip to tail with the force of gravity on the pith ball, tip to tail with the electric force, I get a nice tidy triangle. And since the electric and gravitational forces are perpendicular to each other, this is a right triangle. And since you know the mass of the pith ball, you know the value of Fg. All you have to do is take the mass times 9.81 newtons per kilogram. Then what you can do is with the angle, you can use tangent of the angle equals the electric force over the gravitational force. Throw in the angle, making sure you're in degrees. Throw in the gravitational force that you've calculated, and then calculate the electric force. One final comment here, just because you're almost always asked for the electric force doesn't mean you can't be asked for the force that the string exerts. If you were asked for that, then you wouldn't use tangent. I guess you would use cosine, because the force of gravity is adjacent. Coulomb's law. You learn about Newton's universal law of gravitation in physics 20. But even though it's a physics 20 idea, you still have to be able to apply it in physics 30 from time to time. In fact, this is how I taught you Coulomb's law if you were in my class. I did it by way of comparison. Newton's universal law of gravitation, without talking about a formula, simply says the force of gravity between any two masses is directly proportional to the product of their masses and inversely proportional to the square of the distance. Coulomb's law says the same kind of thing, except that the property of matter responsible for gravity is mass, and that's why mass appears in Newton's law, but the property of matter responsible for electrical forces is charge,
and that's why charge appears in Coulomb's law. Of course, you can do experiments and determine the constant of proportionality, and we get these two formulas. Capital G is a constant that's on your formula sheet, 6.67 times 10 to the negative 11 newton meter squared per kilogram squared. K in Coulomb's constant, or Coulomb's law rather, is also a constant on your formula sheet. It's 8.99 times 10 to the 9 newton meter squared per Coulomb squared. And the reason why I say sometimes you were asked to use both of these is occasionally on an exam you were asked for a ratio of electric to gravitational force between two subatomic particles, which would mean you would have to calculate the kqq over r squared between the particles and the gmm over r squared and compare them as a ratio. Uh, both of the above follow the inverse square law. What does the inverse square law mean? Uh, I wish it was called the reciprocal square law. Uh, I don't really care for the word inverse here, but that's the way it is. What it means is if you change the distance between the objects in either of these two laws, the force will change, but it will change in an opposite way by the square of the factor. So what does that mean? It means if you were to take the distance and double it, that would mean you would be taking the distance and multiplying by two, the new force would be found by taking the force and instead of multiplying, dividing, and instead of by two, by four. If you divide the distance by three, then the square of the opposite would be multiplying the force by three squared. Electric fields, I'm going to start off by talking about this formula. If you look at the bottom of the screen, this Fe equals Q times electric field strength is probably how we would use this formula 95% of the time. It's very similar to saying Fg equals M times gravitational field strength. But it's given to you in the form shown at the top of the screen on your formula sheet. What's important for you to understand is the charge in this formula is a charge that's put in an electric field, and the force is the force it experiences. If you're talking about the source of a field, there are two sources of fields that we study for electric fields. Parallel plates, and there's your formula for the electric field strength between two parallel plates. It's the voltage between the plates divided by the distance between the plates. It doesn't matter what's going on between them. If the plates are three centimeters apart, then your D in this formula is 0 0.03 meters. I'll probably come back to that idea in a bit. And we also have electric fields associated with what we call a point charge or a source charge. And that is KQ over R squared. Be very careful here not to confuse this formula, electric field equals KQ over R squared, with Coulomb's law, which is force equals KQQ over R squared. We're going to come back to those field definitions in a little bit, and there's a lot more that we need to say about them, but for the time being, those are your three electric field formulas. I can guarantee you someplace on your diploma exam you will be asked to analyze the motion of a charge that's accelerated by a voltage or potential difference. The definition of potential difference is potential difference equals change in energy over charge. I want to go back to these formulas for a second and point out to you that whenever we write electric field, we put a vector symbol above it. And very often, in addition to that, we put absolute value signs to indicate we're only caring about the magnitude of the electric field. The reason for that is capital E is the letter we use in physics for electric field, and it's also the letter we use for energy. So this E here, this E here that I've highlighted is energy. The E in the other formulas, 
these E's are electric field. Your definition of your definition of voltage is change in energy over charge. So if I accelerate a charged particle through a potential difference, when I cross multiply this equation, I get its change in energy equals Q delta V. Now as we've learned, man, I don't know where, probably science 10, definitely physics 20, we have learned that the word delta means take the final minus the initial. And if you have an object that accelerates then the type of energy that we're talking about is kinetic energy. And that means that Q delta V becomes 1 half MVF squared minus 1 half MVI squared. And you want to be careful here. Don't assume that the particle starts from rest. If the object does start from rest, then this initial kinetic energy is zero and the equation becomes quite simple very manageable. In fact, I don't know, just guessing in my typical course that I teach, we probably use Q delta V equals a half MV squared for 50 times for the semester in various problems. And that's if the charge does start from rest, but the charge may not start from rest. If it doesn't start from rest, then you have to include this. And it's not very often. So the, the difficulty is you get so used to using this that maybe you miss something in the text of a question. Looking at the two different types of fields now, I'm going to start to tie electric field formulas back to what we would see on paper. You can have parallel plates with an electric field between them, and you can have point charges with an electric field between them. I will speak more later on this, but remember that the direction of an electric field is found by putting in an imaginary positive test charge and asking yourself which way would it experience a force. So on the field on the left, these arrows are all pointing towards the top of the page because the top plate is negative and the bottom plate is positive. And if I put in an imaginary positive test charge, it will be attracted to the negative plate and repelled from the positive plate. So it will be forced towards the top of the page. If I put a positive test charge anywhere in the region of space surrounding the source on the right, it's going to experience a force away from the source. And, and that essentially is the fundamental difference. When you look at these field lines on the left, they're all parallel and they're pointing in the same direction which means the field is uniform. Whereas because these field lines on the right get further away from each other, the field varies depending on the location. So this is a non-uniform electric field, sometimes called a radial electric field. Uh, I don't know if your physics 30 teacher has mentioned this to you, but field lines, the density of field lines is a indirect measurement of field strength. So the closer the field lines are together, the greater the strength of the field. When you look at the diagram on the right, the field lines are close together when we're close to the source, and they're far away from each other when you're far away from the source, whereas over here on the left, well, they're uniform. They're equally spaced. Going back to these formulas now, that's why this electric field strength formula for the parallel plates is voltage over distance. It's got nothing to do with the location in here. Sometimes you're given a question and you're given the voltage between the plates, you're given how far apart the plates are, and you're asked for the electric field here at some point in between the plates, maybe halfway between or six centimeters from the top plate. That's not relevant. You just take the voltage divided by the distance between the plates. Whereas the formula on the right, you can see it makes reference to R, which is a distance away from the source charge. It's very likely that you will see some of these two-dimensional motion problems with charged particles. When you have a particle which is fired horizontally through a vertical electric field, you have to analyze its motion in two dimensions separately. You have to analyze its motion horizontally and vertically. Now keep something in mind. 
I have seen questions, it's been a while, but I have seen questions where the diagram is given to you this way. If the diagram were given it to you that way, then I guess everything that I'm about to say would be opposite to what I'm going to say, to, to what it would be. In other words, when I talk about here, let's cut to the chase now. When I talk about here, this being uniform motion that's horizontally, that's because the diagram is in this orientation. If the diagram were in this orientation and the electron were fired from the bottom of the page, then these two ideas would be opposite. My advice to you, since probably it's the case, probably it's the case that every single example you've done deals with this orientation, my advice to you is if you see a different orientation, take the exam booklet and turn it so that it's oriented properly and do the problem that way. Anyway, there is an electric force on these particles. In this case, it's an electron when it's between the plates and the electric force is vertical, which means the particles will accelerate linearly vertically. But there is no force horizontally, which means there's uniform motion in the horizontal direction. This is just like the projectile motion problems you did in physics 20. Uniform motion, by the way, is physics principle zero on your formula sheet. Vertical motion, which is linear, in this case, accelerated motion, is physics principle one. Whenever you're dealing with uniform motion, you simply have to deal with the speed, the distance, and the time. So this speed here is the initial speed of the electrons, and it's not going to change anywhere throughout its journey. The distance is a horizontal distance, and the time is how long it's been moving. When it comes to accelerated motion, we have a lot more in our list of descriptors. We have initial speed or velocity, final velocity, acceleration, displacement, and time. I'm not including vector symbols here because in my diagram, all of these things will all be towards the bottom plate. In addition to this, if this was all there was, it would be a physics 20 problem. In addition to this, you also have all of your force and electricity formulas. You have F net equals MA. Well, that's a physics 20 idea. But then you have the equation equating the electric field to the electric force and the electric field to the voltage. What makes these problems doable is that these two times are the same. But there is an awful lot of jumping around from formula to formula. For example, you might be asked to find a horizontal distance in one of these problems. But you don't know the time, even though you do know the speed. And when you go over to the vertical side of things, you don't know the time, and you don't have enough information to find the time. But if you knew the acceleration, then you could find the time. Then you could use that time to find the distance. But unfortunately, you don't know the acceleration. However, you happen to know the voltage and the distance between the plates, which would allow you to calculate the electric field. Then, knowing the electric field and the charge, that will allow you to find the force, which is the net force, because it's the only force, so knowing that force and the mass, you can find the acceleration to find the time to find the distance. So they're quite convoluted, these questions. Sometimes in the same situation, you are not asked necessarily for anything else other than what is the final velocity for the charged object? Now be very, very careful here. When I say what is the final velocity, I do not mean what is this. This that I've highlighted is the final vertical velocity. That's how quickly the object or the charged particle is moving downward. But the object or charged particle is also moving to the right 
So the final velocity of the charge is a combination of those two velocities. There's a final horizontal velocity and there's a final vertical velocity which you can find doing everything we talked about here. And once you know them, you can draw them tip to tail to find the resultant velocity. And from those two values, not only can you find the final velocity in terms of the magnitude or how fast, you can also find the direction it's moving. All right. Now we're going to go into magnetism, magnetic domains. It's a, it's a little bit of a simplistic approach to things, but the reason why a magnet is a magnet is inside of the magnet are a bunch of microscopic magnets, which we call domains, and those domains are all lined up. Whereas in a nail that's not magnetized, there are also domains, but those domains are not lined up. If I bring a magnet close to this nail, all of the domains in this nail will align in the presence of the magnetic field of the magnet, and that's what results in the nail being attracted to the magnet. The nail actually becomes a magnet temporarily. Make sure that you can compare gravitational fields, electric fields, and magnetic fields in a number of ways. First of all, what's necessary for fields? Well, you need mass for gravity. And I think this is really important. If there's a gravitational field or a gravitational force for that matter, mass has to be in play somewhere. If you have electrical fields that are going to produce electrical forces, charge is the property of matter that's necessary. And if you have a magnetic field, it's charge and motion. By the way, looking ahead, if you have charge that's accelerated, not only will you have magnetic field, you'll also have an electromagnetic field because that's how EMR is produced. So a charge that's stationary has an electric field. A charge that's moving has an electric field and a magnetic field. You also need to be very familiar with and be able to apply the rules for how we determine directions of fields. The direction of a gravitational field is the direction of the magnetic force on a test mass put in the field. If you want to know the direction of an electric field, then you put in a positive test charge. That's the rule. It has to be a positive test charge. And in order for you to determine the direction of a magnetic field, you put in a test magnet, also known as a compass, and you look at the direction of the force on the north pole of the compass. And that leads us to magnetic field diagrams. If the direction of the magnetic field is the direction that the north pole points on a compass, since the north pole of a compass will point to the south pole of the magnet, the south pole is where the field lines go in. So magnetic field lines from the outside, they come out of the north pole of a magnet and go into the south. If you have two poles that are opposite next to each other, this can be accomplished by using two different magnets or it can be accomplished by using a horseshoe magnet, then you get that field diagram. That's as close to a uniform magnetic field as we're going to get, although this field line at the top and this field line at the bottom are probably not parallel with the others. They're probably bulging outward a bit. Very important rule to know how to use. By the way, sorry, one more thing. This is a non-uniform magnetic field, and this is a uniform magnetic field. Very important rule to know how to use. I call this the curly right-hand rule. If you have a current carrying wire, you have a conductor carrying a flow of charge, the curly right-hand rule is what's used to determine the direction or orientation of the magnetic field that that current creates. This is something that Oersted discovered. 
you grasp the conductor with your right hand so your thumb is in the direction of conventional current. Okay, so what is conventional current? Conventional current is the direction that positive charge would flow in a wire if positive charge flowed in a wire. And positive charge doesn't. Um, don't worry about why we use it. I don't think at this point in the game it's important. It's an imaginary current. It's the direction that positive charge would flow if it could. When you grasp the conductor with those conditions, using your right hand with your thumb pointing in the direction of conventional current, your fingers will curl in the direction of the induced magnetic field. And you have to be able to use that to determine the magnetic poles of a solenoid. I'm not going to try to verbally describe this to you. Um, if I can find one, I'm sure I have a video from a lesson that I've recorded dealing with solenoids. And what I can do is I can email that to everybody if I can find it. And you can look at the part of the video associated with that. The motor effect, huge, huge idea. We're going to spend a lot of time between now and the rest of this video a lot of that remaining time is going to be spent talking about the motor effect and the generator effect. So in general, when you have a charge that's in motion, there's this little circular magnetic field that surrounds the charge. And as long as that charge is moving around, it carries with it its own personal magnetic field. And if that charge happens to encounter another magnetic field, then those two fields influence each other and there's a magnetic force that the charge will experience. That's the motor effect. Basically, charge moving in a magnetic field experiences a force. It's called the motor effect because that's basically how an electric motor works. You have coils of wire and you have magnets inside of an electric motor. And when you connect it to a potential difference, electrons flow through that wire in the presence of the magnetic field so the wires are forced, and the motor spins. If you do have a wire as opposed to a single electron or a single charged particle, then the entire wire experiences a magnetic force. And again, whether we're talking about a single charge or a wire carrying a collection of charges that are in motion, it's the motor effect. If it is a single charge, we have this formula that we can use from your formula sheet to calculate the magnetic force. If it is a collection of charges in a wire, we have this formula. One thing I want to say about the formula on the right, that L is the length of the wire that's within the magnetic field. So you want to be very careful here because on a diploma exam, very often they will show a region of space that's maybe one meter across and they will say that's where the magnetic field is. And then they will show a wire laying across or in that, and the wire's two meters long. You don't use two meters for L, you only use one, because only one meter of the wire is in the field. Occasionally when you use the formula for the magnetic force, also known as the motor effect on a single charge, the charge is not moving perpendicular to the field. I didn't talk about it before, but I'll talk about it right now. If you take a look carefully at this formula, there's a little perpendicular symbol here. Well, that didn't work. There's a little perpendicular symbol here on the velocity or the speed. And what that means is the perpendicular component to the magnetic field. If the particle is traveling at some oblique angle and it's not exactly perpendicular to the field, then you have to use trigonometry to find the perpendicular component. So in the diagram I have here, let's just imagine that this velocity at the bottom is a million meters per second and this angle is 30 degrees. You would simply use trigonometry to find out the perpendicular component and then that would be what you would put in here for V perpendicular. Incidentally, 
Anytime you have a charged particle moving perpendicular to the field, you don't have to worry about that. And if you ever had a charged particle moving parallel to the field, then there would be no magnetic force. Electric current. Formula on your formula sheet says electric current, which is a scalar, is charge divided by time. It's a ratio of how many coulombs of charge flow in a circuit to the time it takes to flow. The charge is measured in coulombs. The time is measured in seconds, which means the current is coulombs per second or amps. Amps are just an abbreviation of coulombs per second. If you're ever asked to determine how many electrons are flowing, then what you can do is determine the charge, and then knowing the charge on one electron, set up a ratio. For example, if you knew that three coulombs of charge flowed in a particular time, you could write x electrons over three coulombs equals one electron over 1.60 times 10 to the negative 19 coulombs, which is, of course, the elementary charge, which is the charge on one electron. I want to talk now, things are coming to a head here. We're going to be reviewing the motor effect. Then I have to talk about the gener generator effect. Then we're going to put them together to talk about Lenz's law. And this is where things get kind of sticky. So. I've already told you that the motor effect in a very general sense is simply the fact that a moving charge in a magnetic field will experience a magnetic force. I want to talk about some other subtleties of it though. In the motor effect, the electrical current produces the magnetic force. And that means that the current is the cause and the magnetic force is the effect. If I'm baking something in my kitchen, and my dog runs in front of me, and I trip on my dog, my dog running in front of me produced my fall, my trip. So my dog is the cause, and me tripping or falling is the effect. And I want you to note that a cause always happens before the effect. I don't trip, and then my dog runs in front of me. I trip because my dog runs in front of me, which means my dog ran in front of me before I tripped. It's kind of important. Another way to look at the motor effect or another subtlety of the motor effect is to understand what's going on in terms of energy. In the motor effect, electrical energy goes in and mechanical energy comes out. Now think about that for a second. What I've told you is that the electrical current produces the magnetic force. Well, electrical current is electrical energy. And the magnetic force is going to cause something to move, which is a type of mechanical energy. What I'd like to do now is put this into a diagram that you would typically see on an exam or you could see on an exam or in your notes. What we've got is a magnetic field. The brown bar is a copper wire. The copper wire is connected to a battery. We know, of course, that the negative terminal of the battery is the short end. And what that tells us is that electrons are going to be pushed away from the negative terminal and move in that direction. What that tells us, and I want to make sure that you get a good idea of what we're talking about here, is that the electrons will be flowing throughout this circuit in this direction. But since electrons are traveling in that direction, conventional current would be traveling in this direction. So the conventional current will be traveling up in this portion of the circuit. It will be traveling to the right in the copper wire and it will be traveling towards the bottom of the page on the right-hand side. So I'm going to use the right-hand rule now to determine the direction that that piece of copper wire is forced. So you're going to have to listen carefully and follow along. I'm sitting at my desk now, and my fingers are pointing into the screen because the X's mean the magnetic field is in. <coughs> 
I'm also arranging it so that my hand, while my fingers are pointing in, and it's my right hand, my thumb is pointing to the right in the direction of this arrow, because that's the direction of conventional current. And now the right hand rule says the force will be out of the palm of my hand. So the motor effect here will predict, and it actually does happen, it's an accurate prediction, that you will get a force on the conductor in that direction. I want to point out to you again, though, that the flow of electrons happens first. Now, whether I'm talking about electron flow or conventional current happening first is not relevant. That's not my point. It's the current that's first, and the second thing that happens is there's a magnetic force. Let's talk now about the generator effect. The generator effect is the opposite of the motor effect. What happens in the generator effect is there's motion that produces electricity. So I don't know if your teacher showed you demonstrations with little handheld generators, but when you take one of these handheld generators and connect it to a light bulb and you crank that generator, you're moving the generator on your own. You're moving coils of wires around and around in the presence of magnetic fields and the light bulb lights. So what happens in the generator effect is mechanical energy is being converted to electrical energy. And again, I, I want to draw a comparison here that I told you the motion produces the current. And then down below, what I'm saying is mechanical energy, well, that's motion, converts into electrical energy well, that's the current. And now we're going to do the same thing that we did with the motor effect. I want to put a diagram to this. So here's the diagram. This time I want you to notice the orientation is not really that important, but I want you to notice that there's no battery. What this is over here is a light bulb. But in order to initiate this generator effect process, I have to take this conductor and I have to move it through the magnetic field. So I'm going to move it to the right. And now we're going to use the right hand rule to predict the direction of the current. So again, I'm using my right hand. My fingers are pointing in to the computer screen. My thumb is pointing to the right. And the only way I can accomplish that is having the palm of my right hand facing the ceiling which means that conventional current will be towards the top of the page. And if conventional current is towards the top of the page in the conductor, I'll put some lines on here to help you out. If the conventional current here is to the top of the page, conventional current is in a clockwise direction around this whole circuit. And of course, that would mean that electrons are flowing in the opposite direction. I want to go back and just show you something that the light bulb isn't lit, but as soon as we move the conductor and get a current, the light bulb lights. But again, the subtleties of this are the following. The cause happens first, and it's the motion. The thing that happens sec second is the electrical phenomenon, in this case, flow of charge. Whether you want to talk about electron flow or conventional current is up to you. Now, the right-hand rules. I purposefully saved talking about the right-hand rules until after we use them because I wanted to get into the cause and effect thing. You were probably taught that the right-hand rule for the motor effect says the fingers of your right hand, of course, are the magnetic field. Your thumb is the direction of motion of the charge or current. And if it's a positive charge or current, the force is out of the palm of your hand. But I want you to notice that what's happened here is the cause is your thumb, whereas the effect is 
is out of the palm of your hand. If we look at the right hand rule for the generator effect, the generator effect says that your thumb is now the motion of the conductor. It's the direction you're moving the conductor. And the current is out of the palm of your hand. But look, we said before that the cause, just have to fix this. We said before that the cause in the motor effect was your thumb. But look at this, the cause in the generator effect is your thumb. We said before in the motor effect that the effect, which is the magnetic force, is out of the palm of your hand, and the effect in the generator effect is out of the palm of your hand. I know that you've been taught two right hand rules, but there's really only one right hand rule. And it can be used for the motor effect and it can be used for the generator effect. Your thumb is the cause, it's what happens first, and out of the palm of your hand is the effect. It's what happens second. I wanna go through a force analysis that you're going to encounter on the diploma exam and then we will deal with Lenz's law and that will close out this video. So when you have a charge moving perpendicular to a magnetic field, it will experience a magnetic force. I'm talking now not about a wire, but about a single charge. And the right-hand rule predicts the direction of the force on that particle. But if you, if you look at your right hand right now, just stop what you're doing and look at it. Hold your hand out flat and square and look at the direction that's out of the palm of your hand and look at the direction your thumb is pointing. Those two things are at 90 degrees to each other. So this net magnetic force, none of that force acts in the same direction as the motion, so the particle cannot speed up. None of this magnetic force acts opposite to the direction of the particle's motion, so the particle cannot slow down. And that means that the particle, even though it's accelerating, doesn't speed up or slow down. And what that means is that it moves in a circle. This is what we call circular or centripetal motion that you learn about in Physics 20. Now, what does that mean? It means in terms of a force analysis that the magnetic force is the net force. I know that you may have been taught the magnetic force is the centripetal force. I would shy away from that. The magnetic force is the only force, so it's the net force. We can calculate net force using MA. We can calculate magnetic force using QVB. But the acceleration is a special type of acceleration. It's centripetal, and it can be found using V squared over R. So you end up with this formula that can be used to analyze the motion of a charged particle in a magnetic field. When we review Thompson's charge to mass ratio experiment, this is precisely how he determines charge to mass. Three-dimensional analysis of a hanging wire in a magnetic field. First of all, what is it you're looking at here? This diagram on the right-hand side, you are looking at the end of a piece of wire that's hanging by a couple of pieces of string, like a swing would be. And we're looking at the end of it. This is identical in terms of the analysis to the one we did with a pith ball hanging on a string. If you're given enough information, you can find the magnetic force. The piece of wire is in what we call static equilibrium. The net force is zero, so these three forces have to add to give zero. And if you're ever asked to determine the magnetic force or the tension in the string or any of those things, then you do a vector diagram analysis like we discussed earlier. Okay, now to finish this off, we're gonna take a look at Lenz's Law. What Lenz's Law does is it starts with the generator effect, 
and leads to a conclusion that is always the same. When you move a conductor relative to a magnetic field, you will produce a current in the conductor. That's the generator effect. But since you've produced a current in the conductor, this now current carrying conductor, this current carrying conductor, it wasn't carrying a current a second ago, but it is now, is in the presence of a magnetic field and it will experience a magnetic force. And that's the motor effect. It turns out what Lenz's law is, or says, is that the direction of this magnetic force that I'm going to highlight, the direction of this magnetic force will always be opposite to the direction the conductor is moved. And it doesn't matter how you set this up. When I move a conductor east through a magnetic field, it will be forced west. When I drop a magnet through an aluminum tube, that relative motion is downwards. There will be a force that is upwards. And that's why in the demonstrations you've looked at in class, a magnet falls slower through an aluminum tube than it does through air. The force always opposes the motion. That's what Lenz's law is. So back to some diagrams. I have a light bulb connected to a piece of copper, real thick piece of copper wire. It's sitting at rest right now in a magnetic field, and I'm going to move it to the right. Of course, now we can use the right-hand rule to predict the direction of the effect which would be generation of conventional current. You point the fingers of your right hand into the screen, your thumb of your right hand in the direction of the cause, which is the motion, and your palm is facing the top of the screen. So the effect, which is a generation of conventional current, is towards the top of the screen, and as you can see, the light bulb lights. But now that current carrying conductor is in a magnetic field, so I'm not going to look at the velocity vector or direction here. I'm simply going to focus on the current, which is towards the top of the screen, and the magnetic field that's in. I'm going to use the right-hand rule by pointing my fingers in and my thumb towards the top of the screen, and my palm faces left, which means the magnetic force created by the current, which, by the way, was created by the motion, that magnetic force created by the current is to the left. We moved the wire first. The second thing that happened was a current was created. We don't need to worry about the fact that it was actually electrons flowing in the opposite direction. That's not relevant. And the third thing that happened is the force. The motion caused the current. The current caused the force. This is like my analogy with me tripping because my dog ran in front of me. Well, what I didn't tell you was a mouse ran across my kitchen floor, and that caused my dog to run in front of me, which caused me to trip. So there's a causal chain in my kitchen that has two links, the mouse causing something to do with my dog, the dog causing something to do with me. This is a two-chain causal chain as well, or a two-link causal chain, I should say. The motion causes the current, and this is the generator effect. The current causes the force, and this is the motor effect. Of course, what we've discovered is the force opposes the motion, and that's what Lenz's law is.